If you were looking for the Brave New World of Online Teaching Talk, you are in the correct room. Congratulations. Uh, my name is Tracy Mihok, and I will be talking to you about some of my experience, um, not, not necessarily specifically with online teaching as a way of teaching, but with online teaching as a way of working. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about what kind of experience I have with that and how that informs some of my ideas for how the future of online work and online teaching could go. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous about this talk because at the end I'm going to have some questions to ask of you guys. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that we can do together to create a, um, you know, a, a good and a better future for online education, not only as something that we do individually, but as a, as a whole industry and as a whole community of online learners and teachers. Um, so I'm really hoping that I can let you know some of my experiences and some of why I think this is important. So before we begin, um, how many of you have good internet access right now? Because I'm going to ask you to fill in a Google form at the end. Okay, this is great. Uh, my follow-up question was going to be who had pens and paper, just in case the internet wasn't working. I've got some of that here, so I guess I can share. Okay, next question. Uh, how many online teachers do we have in the room, either currently or if you've ever taught a lesson online? Cool, we had a bunch of people. And then uh, even, if, uh, even if not online teaching, how many people have um, done some work in the, the sharing or the gig economy, uh, selling things on the internet, I guess, Uber driving, Lyft driving? Okay, we got a couple more other people. Um, great, great. So, yeah, so the, the reason that I'm asking these questions is because um, the online teaching industry, I think, fits very interestingly into this sharing and this gig economy that's really been exploding in the last couple of years. And uh, there's a lot that we can see from other companies about what, what has happened, maybe what we want to avoid and what we want to work towards. Um, but what I really want to understand by the end of this talk is what is something that we can all do together? I want to understand more about your own experiences as online teachers, maybe also as learners, and how can we shape the, the future of this new online work environment? Okay, um, and then right before I, I begin the official part of the talk, I'd really, really like to thank the Polyglot Gathering organizers, especially Georg, for working some magic and moving my talk from the beginning of this. I was really scheduled for the beginning of this conference, um, but they did some amazing work, and, and this is how that I'm able to talk to you guys all now. Um, so maybe just a round of applause real quick for the organizers. Thanks, guys, wherever you are. All right, and let's get started. So I've told you a lot about my talk, but not very much about myself. Um, my name's Tracy Mihok. I previously worked at italki. That's me right there. Um, these other guys standing around me are the rest of the teachers team. Uh, together, we, we, we built and organized the, um, the services for online teachers using italki, and it was amazing. So when I joined italki in 2014, it was a very interesting time, uh, as I later found out, from 2014 to 2018. Um, how many of you remember this, this uh, which side is it? That, that side, this pink italki icon? Yeah, that's what it was in the beginning. And then now, we've, there's so many things have changed, not only in italki only, but also in the, uh, the rest of the environment of online work. Um, even the, the italki brand has also changed. But even those four years there deserve a little bit of context about what else is happening in the world of online work and online teaching. Well, let's find out. So I'm going to look mostly at the last, oh my gosh, 20 years already. Um, time really flies when you put it on the bottom of a slide like that. So uh, in the beginning, there was nothing, and then there was Skype. Okay, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, definitely some things came before and after Skype. Um, but Skype was a, a huge part, I think, for all of us, uh, not only for talking with friends and family, but also the beginnings of exploring uh, other languages and cultures and being able to talk with other people. So let's put Skype there where it began in 2003. That's when Skype was founded. Now, I actually didn't hear about Skype until 2006 was the first time I heard about it because a friend of mine was going to be living in Germany and she was asking all of us to try out this weird new thing where you could talk on like, like on the internet with other people so that we could actually keep in touch while she was in a different country. And that was, that was really weird and different to me at that time. Now it's normal and we pretty much do it every week. 
All right, a little more context for Skype. Skype doesn't exist alone. Um, this is reminding myself and you guys as well, hopefully, that Skype came in a context of other services on the internet, which now are very normal, but at that time were completely new and different. And uh, for good measure, let's add a bunch of other language things on here too. So I just went out and grabbed some of the, uh, the icons that I know from language learning that I thought you guys might also recognize. Pimser was back in 1963, guys. That was a really long time ago. And I know the Polyglot Gathering logo is different, but uh, that was the, the first Polyglot ga Gathering over there. Um, you know, in the middle, we have a couple of other services. And then uh, in 2007, along came Italki. Now, the reason that I have it separate from some other things like Live Mocha and, and Memorize on here is that these are great online services providing content. You could create content, you could download content and practice content. Um, but Italki was one of the first uh, language learning sites for actual people. It was encouraging people to talk with each other live, not only by uploading or downloading content. All right, these are not language learning websites, Airbnb and Uber, but they came right along after that, 2008, 2009, and uh, this was the beginning of, of what now are these huge companies uh, through which many, many people get services and also uh, get work and earn income. So let's put them on their place. Oh my gosh, and then for some reason, all kinds of language companies were starting 2011 to 2013. And when I say some reason, I, I guess that reason is largely due to the Chinese market. Um, if you don't recognize some of these names in online language learning, it's because they're ones that I'm familiar with, and I'm familiar with them because I was working in China when they started marketing and advertising themselves to an audience there that really, really wanted mostly English learning uh, for their kids and for their families and didn't feel that the school system was necessarily providing them with, uh, with what they needed for their kids. So a huge amount of language companies then, and these ones also are... Um, uh, like a teacher working with the student online. Uh, Verbling and Preply are not Chinese companies, but the other ones, I think we're all part of this like Chinese marketing push. All right, so we'll put them there. Oh yeah, 51 Talk. When I was in China and people learned that I worked at Italki, sometimes they'd say things like, oh, you work at 51 Talk? And I'd be like, well, they didn't say it like that, they'd say it in Chinese. Um, but, <laughs> but then I'd be like, no, it's it's, like that, but it's not that. Anyway, that was more of the, the Chinese version. Okay, and then 2014, that's when I joined Italki. I was a little late to the game here, but uh, in my defense, a lot of other people hadn't heard too much about these companies either yet, because I've got the, I've got the dates of when the companies were founded, but they weren't really doing huge marketing pushes yet. I mean, people saw 51 talk, but the later, uh, if, if you were in Shanghai, after the time when I joined Italki, just all of a sudden the metro stations were filled with these like giant wall, like full wall advertisements for these English um, or in language teaching companies, also like giant billboards on the streets, it's everywhere. All right, so here's Italki. Um, this is what it was like. There was a couch on the top. You could fit at most five people on this couch. Uh, I started at Italki back when everybody could fit around two tables. And um, the reason I'm showing you these slides is because I, I want to make the impression that now the shared economy and gig workers, uh, the gig economy is a pretty normal thing. But then it was, it was new. It was this sort of unexpected thing. And I remember sitting there with everybody, checking customer support tickets and seeing what people were complaining about or what people had for questions. Um, and we handled the tickets from teachers. So people would, of course, have questions about uh, working with students, their online payments, stuff like that. And then one teacher was elaborating on their situation. And they were telling us that actually they were getting like 80, 100% of their income from Italki. And we were like, whoa. What? <laughs> because when Italki started, it was this online community where people could share and exchange languages. It was more of like a language partner finding community. And then later on, this all happened before I joined, later on they realized, oh, okay, maybe some people can do more teaching. And they created the teacher profile to help people learn um, by finding those teachers. And uh, I think our expectation was that uh, maybe similar to the beginnings of Airbnb and Uber, uh, like, oh, great, you know, if people have a little extra time, then they can use that time for teaching, they can get paid a little extra money, like, that's great, everybody wins, right? 
but we were thinking of it more as like a, a thing that you do an extra time for extra money thing. And all of a sudden, we had not one, but multiple teachers. And then we did a survey, and we found there were even more people that were really using italki as not just like a, like a source of some extra income, but, but a huge source, a major source of income, and that they were relying on for, for how they lived and for their normal payments. And we were like, holy cow, this suddenly feels like a lot more responsibility than it did <laughs> before. All right, well, what do we do with that? Um, so here I am joining italki, but not finding out about any of these things yet. Uh, shortly after 2016, 2017, the gig economy really exploded, and now more, more other countries or companies, not just China, um, are, are having these kinds of, of online, uh, online working, online teaching situations. Uh, also, shout out to the Online Teacher Summit, which I was very pleased to see. I felt like that was a, a mark of maturity in the online teaching community and industry that now it's not just random people teaching alone from their rooms in Skype, but it becomes this normal thing that people can do as freelancers and it enables them to travel and visit other parts of the world. And then it enables people to meet each other and we get together and we have these conferences. I'd like to see that continue. Uh, but first, sharing economy, gig economy, 1099 workers, these are all words that I never really thought about until a few years ago and then suddenly they were everywhere. Uh, people were wondering, are we employees? Are we contractors? Are we freelancers? And it wasn't just a couple of random people. It was a lot of people. It was thousands of people. If you add all the companies together, it's probably millions of people. Um, and then these started happening. And you start reading all these news articles. So I've, I've expanded. This is not only language learning, but I think this also includes um, just the gig economy in general. So there are all these articles that we started seeing about what happens when you have people that are doing something that started off as a, you know, a thing to do on the side or a thing to do some extra money, which is now starting to become what they're organizing. Their, they're basically giving themselves like full-time jobs, maybe even I'll call it full-time plus jobs around these things. Um, and I started wondering, what does it mean that we're, we're creating this environment? Like we're creating these online work environments and we're creating uh, these situations where it's great that people, it, it's definitely there's a lot of opportunity, but there's also a lot of um, consequences, I think, that come along with the workforce uh, and, the, and the, the shape of work, the way that people work changing like this. So the question that I started asking was, well, what is the future of online teaching? I think we've seen a lot of articles about like Uber versus Lyft and uh, Airbnb and how do those people make or report taxes and um, you know not only just in the financial side but what does it mean for how people spend their time and what does it mean for how people can expect to make a living and uh, this is worth considering in a very different way for online teaching because online teaching is really different than any of these other gig economies. This is something that we ran into at Italki as well, as we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we do business? How do we design the interface of the website? Um, can we compare it to eBay? In China, there's sort of like a Taobao, which is like Chinese eBay. Um, can we compare it to uh, buying other things online? Can we compare it to Uber? And my personal answer, um, like I, I need to, if I haven't said it before, I should probably state officially, like I, I haven't been working at Italki for over a year now. I can't speak for anything that Italki is doing right now, um, but I am speaking from my own personal experience, my own personal opinions, and, uh, and it really made me wonder, um, online teaching is very different because it, it engages a teacher and the student in, uh, um, in an ongoing learning and teaching relationship that is very different than just rating um, the, you know, the quality of an Airbnb stay or saying whether your product was acceptable or defective. How, how do you report problems? How do you, how do you manage transactions in a situation that is so much more personal um, than a lot of these other services? And uh, it really, like right now, I, I feel like we are in an interesting position where we have the chance to change the future. Uh, the future is not necessarily bad. Okay, so <laughs> I'm worried. Please, please don't think that it's not like everything is this way or that everything will be this way. I put some extremes up here. I hope you can tell from how I made this slide, part of the slide, all like black and scary and foreboding, and the other side is like happy and you know hopeful and optimistic. Um, you know, the reality will be somewhere in between this. But you know, these the the ones that I've listed on this side are some concerns that I've seen from the way that other parts of the shared or the gig economy are going. Um, 
from from being on the inside of a business, uh, I can say that it's it's very difficult on a high level to to look down on all the resources that you need in order to make your business work and figure out like which are the ones that require more or different attention. What are the resources that we have to work with? How do we optimize what we have? Um, how do we keep doing business and also do business in a way that is um, is, is appropriate to the kind of business that we're doing? Um, Okay, like I, won't, I won't read the things off on the sides because that would be boring. But you know, I personally would like to see a world where teachers are not simply like, uh, like we see the articles about Uber drivers being managed by algorithms and stuff like that. Like I'd like to see, especially for teaching, I think it's important that we look for a future where teachers are not a line of code, but teachers are considered to be part of the community and part of contributing to how do we create these positive learning experiences and how do we provide these services for the students. Um, in not only for online teaching, but in general. I, I feel like I see an erosion of the respect for the professionalism of teachers. This probably isn't true in all countries, um, but in, at least in the United States where, where I just was between working in China and now I work in the UAE, it, it seems like we're expecting more and more of the educational system, but we're not necessarily supplying teachers with the resources that they need or the credit for the professionalism that they have. So how do we communicate that importance to uh, businesses, to products, to technology? Uh, where did my clicker go? There we go. All right, so I do have some possible answers for some of these things. Um, Let's start with product management. So product management is a role in a company where basically you need to figure out what is the product or in some cases services that we're providing. And it requires balancing a lot of interests. So you need to have the business side of it because you know, regardless of your opinions about marketing or business or making money, at the end of the day, you need to be able to pay your employees and you need to be able to support the ongoing business because otherwise a lot of people who are depending on it will suddenly find themselves out of work or will be disappointed when you can't provide that service. All right, technology, so many things happen on the internet now. You need quality tech to keep things working. You need to keep up with uh, what, what the tech interfaces are and um, what the policies around that are and how to implement it in a good way. And you need UX, UX design. You need to understand who the customer is and how, how is your great product going to serve the needs of that customer. And I think that when it comes to educational products, there's another section that needs to be considered. Um, I currently do not know of any really good examples. Uh, if you have examples, please let me know because then I'll feel better about it. But I, I, it's hard for me to think of good examples of ways that educational quality is really brought into the considerations of a business and of a company. Um, this isn't really anybody's fault. It's just that in my experience, people who, who come through, um, like if you think of the education or the background that a person needs to have in order to become a professional as a designer or as a tech person, or as a business manager, there's a lot of specialized experience and it's hard to get experience from multiple fields. And so, especially for educators, a lot of people come through an education system where they become teachers or professors and they don't necessarily have these, these other parts. I mean, same thing for business, right? People who are like really well trained in business have a lot of experience there. They don't necessarily have the understanding of what really makes a valuable educational product and what is it that really delivers the value and helps students learn. Um, so this is something that I think needs to be incorporated into these. Uh, I think, my personal opinion here, I think that ideal educational product management would include a, an education blob here that, that is not only just something that advises the other groups, but is, is actually like intricately involved in understanding what is the business of how we provide this education? What is the design? What is the technology? Uh, these are ways that I'd, I'd like to see businesses working more with teachers. But at the same time, um, teachers also need to find ways of working more with businesses. Um, I, this is, I'm just making, it's making me think of the customer support tickets that we would try to respond to. And we got used to the ways that the students and the teachers would talk when they contacted us. But it was sometimes very hard to translate that to the other business and product and tech sides of the company so that they understood. Um, so I wanted to share this with you because I feel like this is actually something that we all are a little more familiar with. Language and culture differences. So if I go back to um, this one here, I, th I think one reason that a lot of these have difficulty communicating with each other is by the time you come through this background and you are an expert in this subject, you're like 
in a way, you have very significant language and culture differences from the other, uh, the other parts, these other circles here. Uh, if you think about it, you know, people who are very advanced in computer science or technology, they just talk in a different way than people who are um, very experienced with business, who talk in a different way than people who are very experienced with education. So I started trying to teach uh, other people on my customer support team and in the teacher team the user story. How many people are familiar with user stories? Okay, great. So maybe you can, you can help the others as we go through this. I felt kind of bad giving a talk that didn't have anything about like language lessons. So we're going to have some language practice right now. Here's how to talk as a user story. This is how product managers talk. This is also how uh, techs, tech people, developers, um, often also understand this language. This language comes from agile product development. It has three main parts, an identity, a request, and a reason for that request. So let's go through them one by one. Okay, identity. So you want to start off identifying who you are if you have a request. You're going to say who you are as a user and what kind of user of some product or service are you. In a lot of cases, this might be I, uh, you know, as an online teacher, something, something. What would you like? You probably have some kind of feature request or some kind of um, situation that you want solved. So you just state that. And then you also make sure to give a reason. Because sometimes the developers or the product managers or whoever it is that you're talking to, sometimes they can't do exactly what you want. And there might be a very good reason why they can't do exactly what you want. But if you tell them the reason, then maybe they can fulfill that reason, but in a slightly different way. So that's why that's important to know. And we have some examples. I and mean, what would a good language practice thing be without examples? So let's read some goat user stories. This is a Twitter account. You can follow goat user stories to see pictures of goats. All right, let's try it. Um, as a goat, identity, I want to mentor junior goats. Request. Okay, very clear what the goat wants. Why? So that they will feel confident about challenging me on code reviews. Okay. So now we know why the goat wants this. Even if we can't set up a mentorship program, we understand that the reason is that they want the junior goats to feel more confident for the reason that then the junior goats will be able to challenge them instead of only accepting what they say. Okay, that was pretty easy. Let's try another one. All right, who can identify the, uh, the identity part of this user story? Yes. What is the, the identity? Yes, it's a goat, as a goat. Um, but not only a goat, but this is a, a more specific kind of goat. What kind of goat is this? Yes, a goat with experience on the platform and in the framework. What does he want? What is the request from this goat? Yeah, yeah, I heard help, help onboard the herd mates. Why? Why does he want to onboard the herd mates? Yes, very good, very good. Okay, so I think, I think we're understanding the uh, sort of the grammar, as we will, of this practice. Um, we have a more balanced team. Okay, in the interest of time, I'll keep moving along. I was going to make you guys uh, give me some user stories, but I hope that you'll still do that later. Next, zebras. So you might be thinking to yourself, that's really great if I can form my requests, but why should a business or a product uh, listen to the things that we have to say? After all, isn't it in their interest to be making money and isn't in their interest, I mean, if they can get teachers to, to work for a certain rate and for a certain amount of time, um, you know, isn't, isn't that sort of what businesses are allowed to do? And the glimmer of hope that I want to offer to this is, uh, are called zebra startups. So what is a zebra? Um, this is a new organization that was started in the United States. I'm sure we've all heard of unicorns and the idea of unicorn startups um, getting a very high valuation and then you hear about the founders and they're in the news and it's like worth billions of dollars. Those are the unicorns. Uh, but what about zebras? So the byline for zebras kind of is, is that zebras fix what unicorns break. Uh, there's a whole you know move fast and break things kind of attitude in development and zebras are a little bit more concerned about well, what is the experience like for the people? What is the experience like for these communities? Uh, let's see, yes, we just mentioned unicorns. Um, unicorns, uh, their, their directives often shareholder profit. 
So they, they really have a responsibility to turn over a large amount of profit for their shareholders. Uh, but what about prosperity? What if we measure success of businesses not only by the financial returns, um, but what if there's other metrics or other values that we can use to measure success? And that's where we get zebras, because uh, I've cleverly given these white and black labels, and zebras are black and white by nature. They're both of these things. They don't have to choose one at the expense or the sacrifice of the other. They choose both. So what does that mean for online teachers? Uh, and this is the part where I start asking you guys for things. I think that it could be a really significant thing to have some kind of an organization or an association that understands the needs of online teachers and is able to uh, sort of be a voice or a representation of teachers. So what does that mean? These are some things that I noticed seem to be missing for online teachers. Uh, some kind of a professional development network, like an official professional development network, you know, not, not only these informal networks that I know people have sort of created to support each other. Um, representation for online teachers, polls or data about industry health, the same way that we have reports about 1099 workers. Certifications. Um, as I was working at Italki, we noticed that it was very rare that anybody would have specifically online teaching certification, and these did not seem very easily accessible or widespread. And yet, online teaching is such a different experience than classroom teaching. So how can we better prepare people to be, um, to, to be experts and to be professionals in this field? And uh, as I'm thinking about this, it sounds to me kind of like some sort of Dave's ESL Cafe for online teaching. Uh, how many people remember Dave's ESL Cafe? Or have used it recently. Oh, okay, maybe. Well, I guess it could have been a long time ago. So Dave's ESL Cafe was a way for, um, uh, especially English teachers, teaching abroad to find information about what countries or what schools were reputable or that they could go to or find connections there. Um, yes, so now, now is the part where I hope everybody who raised their hands that said they had the internet was telling the truth. If you could please, in your mobile phone, so this will be a group activity. Everybody take out your phone, I'll do it with you. And please go to nounly.com slash farm. That is a short link for a Google survey or a Google form. Um, so you should be seeing a form that says a better world of online teaching. And this is the part where just because I don't know of good resources like these doesn't mean they're not out there. So if you know of something like this um, or something that's listed on the form, please do write it down because I'd really like to understand if there's things like this that already exist for teachers um, or what things perhaps do not exist yet and what we could do to contribute to that. I will, let's see, I'll give you guys a couple of minutes. And for anybody who is not uh, viewing that on their phone, I have it here. So if you don't feel like using the internet or if you don't have the internet, you can write this down. I would be happy to collect it. I have paper. I'll just talk through each of the things, but um, feel free to to ignore me and uh, continue filling in the form. So it just starts off with your name. Um, second is what sort of experience you relate to. So I had that diagram before of these different areas of experience. And I'm curious um, what sort of representation we have out here, if there's people that are also uh, feel comfortable with tech or business or design in addition to teaching. And then specifically what sort of role uh, you have if you feel like describing that. Oh, sorry? Um, I have some paper here. I'd be happy to give you. Oh. Um, if you're an offline teacher, too, feel free to list that. I, I imagine some of these resources could even be useful for offline teachers. Okay, the next questions are related to some of those resources that I just mentioned. Um, even if you don't know of specific related to online teaching resources, uh, if you know of good examples, 
For example, maybe you don't know of a, of a good advocacy group for online teachers, but you do know of a good advocacy group for some other kind of, of group or some other kind of online resource. Um, that could be a good model or a good example of something that we could do for online teachers. And uh, number five is also, if you, um, if, you know, that's an optional question, but if you have any particular ideas uh, about what you would like the future of online teaching or of online work to be like, maybe something different than it is now. And of course, if you would like me to collect your email address for purposes of sending you um, some of the results of what other people have put here, uh, or keeping you updated if this is something that more people get together on, and then maybe something that we can um, pool some knowledge and resources and share together of, you know, collectively, what can we imagine this future of online teaching like, and how can we make that happen? And if you don't want to fill in any of the information in the form, but you uh, want to tell me what you think about online teaching, feel free to email me. That's my email address. Has anybody completed the online form? Okay, cool. Then I, I won't just stand here and keep talking. Um, so that's really what I wanted to ask from you guys. Uh, I hope I've been able to explain some of the context of, of what I've seen happening in online teaching. Um, I think it is a really interesting time that we're in right now and uh, very different than it was a couple of years ago. I do hope that, um, I, I was very excited to talk with a group like this about it because the Polyglot Conference, the Polyglot Gathering, you know, to me this is where a lot of these things really got started by people like us that are already doing these kinds of things in our own individual lives, coming together and finding ways of doing it together and finding ways of doing it in a way that's better for everybody. Um, so if that's something that you want to stay in touch with, please, uh, this is my Twitter, Telegram, email, and uh, of course the link to the form. And uh, does anybody have any questions? questions on Slido. Thank you. Okay, and um, uh, how can teachers get more students on italki? Uh, what's the algorithm that puts you in the front page? So those are really good questions for someone who works at italki. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't work at italki anymore. Uh, it's probably not very useful for me to explain the previous algorithms, which were not, not particularly complicated. Um, I'm afraid I can't answer that question and I don't want to try just in case I say something that's wrong and that's not applicable now. Sorry to whoever answered or asked that question. Okay, there is also a question uh, which got a lot of votes. Uh, this is rather a question to fellow teachers in the audience. Uh, can you or do you know anyone who actually can earn a living solely by online teaching? Uh, who can live solely by online teaching? So we've got a bunch of hands up there. Does that mean that you make, like you personally make your living by online teaching? Awesome, awesome. Okay, uh, how many people, like maybe not you personally, but you know somebody who makes their living by online teaching? Oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. Um, Okay, another question about Italki. I'm not sure it's um, okay. Something that probably affects most teachers. Most teachers. Can you give an honest explanation uh, why Italki removed the instant tutoring? Oh my gosh, I cannot. <laughs> uh, it was removed after I left. Um, I have very strong opinions about instant tutoring, but uh, perhaps I can share those individually <laughs> after the talk. <laughs> okay. Could you also talk about your teaching methods? My personal teaching methods. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a lot of extensive experience teaching online, but I think that some of my, some of my favorite methods are also very simple. <laughs> um, I usually use, so right now italki has its own, um, uh, what is it, like a lesson interface. Um, I was still using Skype at the time when I was teaching, and uh, the things that I found most useful or pretty much just like being able to share documents or being able to share images. Um, so as a teacher and as a student, I found that I was able to keep a lesson 
in the target language more easily if I was also like going and pulling images from Google, let's say, uh, and using that to supplement the, uh, the text. Um, I, yeah, I've had some, some really good conversations where it might have been very hard to do that only with audio, but because we were also using, um, and not, not only text either, but pulling in images and finding other ways of explaining what we meant uh, and, and continuing the interactions that way. Google Docs is also really helpful. It, it doesn't sound very impressive, any of the things that I'm mentioning, but I think that, um, I think that one of the best features of a teaching tool is that it's very simple and versatile, and then that would allow a teacher or a student to use it in whatever way is helpful for them at that time in the lesson. I don't know if that answered the question, but. Okay, uh, what's the main difference between italki and preply, preply, sorry, I preply, don't know. Preply, preply. Um, one's based in like China and the other one's not. Okay, no, I, this is also a bad question because I haven't been keeping up with these for about the last year. <laughs> um, it's, been a, it's been a year since I worked at italki. Um, the thing that comes to mind mostly is that italki really focused on language learning specifically. And I understand that Preply has also branched into other ways of teaching online, for example, um, coding. And I, uh, I know they were doing something with coding. I don't remember if they have additional things now. And that's interesting because, of course, it's more different things that can be taught online, uh, whereas Italki was really focusing on languages and how do we offer more different languages rather than like more different subjects. If, if, I, if you ask any of these questions and you feel like I'm not answering them, feel free to shoot your hand back up in the air and I'll try to notice. I just don't know who the questions are coming from since they're all on the, the Sido, Sido thing. Oh, yeah. I can't speak to that because I haven't taught on both of them. Um, coming from italki, I'd personally recommend italki, of course, but, <laughs> uh, but I, I can't, I don't know enough to compare them really. Uh, the, the question is about whether Preply also provides local tutors, but I'm not sure what you mean. What do you mean by local tutors? Oh, um, I don't know anything about that, actually. Uh, on italki, at least a year ago, I can't speak for current italki, but at least a year ago, um, everything was organized online, and the expectation was that these lessons would happen online because people would be in different cities or different countries. Uh, but I do know of some situations where the teacher and the student were in the same city, and they were like, oh, well, why don't we just meet up? And of course, then they could, so that was great. But usually that can't happen if you're in different countries. Uh, if an app only rates teachers without any care for certification, what's the value of certification? If an app only admits... Only rates teachers without any care for certification, what is the value of certification? Oh, I think I might need more context for a question like that. I'm assuming that that question is coming partly from the fact that there are a lot of platforms that, that have different, I guess, let's say different qualifications for it. Is, is the asker of this question here? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's just that it's not necessarily the, the fact will require yeah. So yeah. So, I mean, that's where, like, if you can, I don't want to click back in the slides, but if you can reimagine the one that had, like, those four bubbles, like, that's one reason why I really think that education needs to be a component of all those other things. Um, because if, if, it, if we have teachers with certification, but if the website is not making use of that to differentiate the teacher in some way or to communicate to the students, like, this teacher has certification or this one doesn't, then it's very hard for the students to take that into consideration if they don't know. And it's also very hard for the teacher to use that as a positioning or as a way of saying like, like you know, here, here are things that I'm qualified to do or things that I've been trained to do. Is, is, that, is that, yeah, and so I mean, like it, it depends, right? So I think the question was generally, um, like generally if an app or website does that, you know, and the, the real answer where I was saying maybe I need more context for this, is um, depending on which app that is, there's probably other ways that it can be done. Of course, 
some of those put a lot of responsibility on the teacher to just find a way of representing that as opposed to something that the platform or the app would be really using as um, part of their own positioning. Because of course, if you have very well qualified teachers, that's something that the app or the website or the company should be able to be proud of and to be able to, to use in their own marketing. Um, that's, I feel like that's a very unsatisfactory answer to your question, but it's also sort of an unsatisfactory topic and one of the reasons why I think it would be important to have um, greater, greater attention to the professionalism uh, and to certification specifically for online teaching. Uh, that, that also happens in like schools sometimes too. There's schools that will just like accept people, anyone who's a native speaker of a language and it's like, well, I think we all know that native speakers are not necessarily teachers, but yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry, are we? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right, right. Yeah, so, and, and that, that too, right? There's, yeah, and I guess I, Right, but both of them are, are ways of teachers showing like professionalism and qualifications and websites or companies could use that in different ways or promote that in different ways. Okay. Are we out of time? Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for coming out. Um, please do you know, offer any suggestions, and I'd be very happy to talk with anybody who uh, would like to be, I don't know, offering more ideas about like what is this future of online teaching and how can we make sure that it's a good future for everybody involved. Thank you very much.